Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to have you along. Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to Red Ice Creations Radio. New and regular listeners, welcome. Good to have you along. My name is Henrik Palmgren. We are coming to you from the west coast of Sweden in Scandinavia. We are here on Thursdays and Sundays doing radio on important and uh, interesting subjects for your consideration. We highlight everything from conspiracy, secret societies, history, religion, to new and emerging technologies, uh, mass control, geopolitics, the occult, space news, spiritual topics, environmental issues, and uh, much, much more. Our website is redicecreations.com. That's R-E-D-I-C-E creations.com. Take a look around, follow along in our daily updated news, and don't miss out on the um, all the material that we have for you in our member section. Video, short films, radio with extended interviews with many of our guests, and uh, much more of that in the pipeline. All information is available on our website. And uh, today we have author Eric John Phelps back with us on the program. He is, of course, behind the book Vatican Assassins. We had Eric with us back in uh, September last year talking about his book, which... Now it's uh, it's it's in its uh, third edition, I think. It's available as a PDF, and uh, it's got an incredible 1,836 pages. Uh, his website is vaticanassassins.org. Go there, take a look at, uh, at all the articles he's got up there for you, and uh, do get a copy of the book if you're interested in the research that will be discussing here today. Uh, we're going to begin to talk about the Vatican connection and the potential creation of Islam and uh, move on from there forward in history to discuss some other connections to the consequent terror fraud as it were related to Al-Qaeda and uh, what we've seen after the 9-11 attacks and look at some of the establishment connections to all of this. Uh, so with that, welcome back to the program, Eric. Uh, nice to have you on the program again. Pleasure to be with you, Henrik, and your listeners today. Thank you for coming on. Much appreciated. Uh, I want to begin here right at the top, so to speak, and uh, go back about, uh, what is it, 14 to 1500 years. And uh, the official story goes that the uh, you know, Prophet Muhammad was receiving re- revelations from God and uh, that this was memorized and recorded by some of his companions. And uh, this became as what we know as the Quran today. And Muhammad lived between, I think, 570 and 632 B.C. Uh, I mean, to start right with that, Eric, do you think that that story is a fraud, or is there some uh, some truth to that, you think? Well, as far as Constantine, uh, pardon me, as far as uh, Islam being started by Muhammad, is that what the question is? That's right, that's right. Um, well, according to Alberto Rivera, and I believe his testimony in the Chick publication, The Prophet, I believe, and it can be substantiated from a few other sources, that um, Islam is a creation of the Vatican through the Augustinian monks of North Africa, and that they were the ones who were responsible ultimately for the rise of Muhammad, and that they tutored him also. And the purpose for uh, Islam being created by the Vatican was, number one, to block the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Arab people. Uh, Number two, to use the Arab peoples for the killing of the racial Jews throughout Arabia and North Africa, and also to use the Arab peoples for the killing off of true Bible-believing Arabs and racial Jews and Uh, even some black Africans in northern Africa, going all the way across North Africa to invade Spain, finally, and to uh, kill off the Arians, who denied the the Roman Catholic, the papal trinity, as opposed to the biblical Bible-based trinity. And so that's why the Muslims occupied Spain and uh, for nearly some 700 years. So the purpose for the Vatican in creating Islam was to use Islam as a sword of the church to kill off the enemies of the papacy, while at the same time keeping an arm's distance, the papacy keeping an arm's distance from this killing, so it looks like the Vatican is innocent, and it's and it's that evil, wicked Islam that's doing it apart from any papal control. Right, right. But I, right, so I get into this in a CD that I have just finished. I use it at the conspiracy conference uh, in June of this year, 
and uh, I wasn't happy with it. I had, I had put in probably 900 hours in it, and it wasn't a good contrast for a uh, overhead for a PowerPoint. So I added 100 more slides. I completely redid the contrasting. I enlarged the letters, and I finished it about three weeks ago. So I have 1,000 hours over in the production of this CD PowerPoint that I get into these points that your listeners can purchase, and then they, too, can begin to present this to their friends. And it's, it's very user-friendly. The person doesn't have to know anything about it. It's all self-explained with lots of good pictures and illustrations, 412 slides or PowerPoints. But, um, and, and that is uh, available uh, at your website, I guess, then? available my website just contact me um, through the website and it's 20 Federal Reserve notes plus shipping and I don't know what the shipping would be in Sweden but I'll just have to figure that out when I get an order beautiful yeah it's, 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 it's affordable and I regard it as a, tr a tremendous sequel to my book and by the way I do have Vatican Assassins now in book form it's 13 pounds it's nine and a half by by 12 it's uh, five and a, five inches thick and so it's, it would cost something to ship, but it is now in one book form, so if anybody would want to have the book, they can also order that too. It's 325 Federal Reserve notes plus shipping, so that's okay. available. And then I have my Jesuit Watch newsletter that comes out bi-monthly, six, six issues per year that is now available too, and that's 40 Federal Reserve notes a year. And please forgive me by using the term Federal Reserve notes. <laughs> they're not dollars. I understand. Uh, do, you know, they're Federal Reserve notes, so in, in being a Bible believer, I should be honest about what the notes we're using. So that's, in fact, what they are. Well, it's good to clarify that. That gives a kind of a, you know, a mental reminder of what it is uh, you guys uh, are, are uh, you know, uh, dealing with over there, so to speak. So that's a good one. Right. Um, the Post, the Post Federal Reserve Bank with the Post Federal Reserve notes, and the Federal Reserve notes are nothing more than indulgences Evidences of debt, so we can go out and sin and incur debt to be more indebted to the Federal Reserve Bank, controlled by the Knights of Malta. Hmm, there you go. Uh, okay, let, let's get back on, uh, on on track here, Eric, and talk a little bit more about the. You mentioned the Augustinian monks. Uh, do you think that they are potentially then responsible for uh, pinning down the the Quran, or do you think that uh, this was actually written by a you know uh, a, an historical character like Muhammad? No, Muhammad was an illiterate. He couldn't write. So it was done by others, just like Mein Kampf was written by others. Hitler was not an author. He never wrote a book. He didn't have the capacity. So the same way with Muhammad. So it was written for Muhammad, and I'm convinced that priests of North Africa had a hand in writing it. And uh, you can find many of the tenets in the Quran to be the exact same tenets of the Roman Catholic canon law. For example... Uh, the one of the tenets of Islam is that those who do not believe in the false prophet Muhammad are what are called infidels. Well, in Romanism, in uh, the teaching of the canon law, if you do not, if you're not a member of the Roman Catholic Church, if you don't believe in the false prophet, the Pope, because the Pope considers himself a prophet, if you don't believe in the Pope, you're a heretic. Mm. So, what is deemed an infidel in Islam and worthy of death? is deemed a heretic in canon law and worthy of death. Right. Here's another... Are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. So here's another parallel. In Islam, they have what are called jihads. Right. And a jihad is a holy war. In Romanism, you have what are called crusades. They are holy wars. Same exact thing. In, in, in Islam, you have a man of blood founding Islam, Muhammad, very immoral man, had many wives, illiterate. He is, uh, I have, there's a book written, available by Chick Publications, who is talks of a former Muslim who truly converted to Christ and born again. He tells the true story about Muhammad, and you can get that from Chick Publications. But in Islam, you have Muhammad founding Islam, at least openly, and in Romanism, you have Constantine founding Roman Catholicism. Right, right. Remember, Roman Catholicism doesn't exist one day prior to 325 A.D. Right. 
Roman, Roman Catholicism was created at the Council of Nicaea through Constantine. So you have this parallel between Mohammed, Constantine, heretic, uh, uh, um, infidel, heretic, jihad, crusade. They have central cities. And with Romanism, you have Rome as a central city. In Islam, you have Mecca as a central city. Hmm. So, so these parallels are identical. And we should not be surprised, therefore, because the papacy existed almost 300 years before Islam. Islam was founded in 610 A.D. Mm -hmm. uh, Romanism was founded in 325. The first pope is Sericius, and about uh, 399 he's called pope. Uh, but the first uh, pope to be given universal spiritual power was in 606 with uh, Gregory. So, so you have the establishment of Romanism with all of its beginning powers and universal um, uh, spiritual power over every human creature uh, four years before the founding of Islam. And the, the, the papacy could not reach to Arabia to carry out its decrees. So cre it created what is called the second son. Islam is the second son, uh, really, of the devil. And so Islam, being an extension of Romanism, it would carry out the essential doctrines of Rome under the guise of another religion. Hmm. Interesting. And, you know, the, the question, of course, is, and you brought this up, why, why because, again, on the surface, uh, f for someone who is, you know, new to, to a subject like this, it can't get it through, you know, why would the Vatican be instrumental in creating an enemy of the Christian faith? Because that goes, uh, you know, obviously against logic. But what you were saying, Heron, to clarify that again, is that they're using this in order to create uh, a, a this this uh, dichotomy, if you will, of these warring factions. And in such a war with uh, such huge battles going on, you can consequently control populations better. You can kill off a lot of people that you're uh, basically you want to get rid of. Is is that correct, Eric? That's that's correct. And the other thing we want to remember is we always must just define true Bible-based Christianity as those people who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for their sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again and coming back. And the Bible is the final authority for faith and practice of a true Christian. Romanism, on the other hand, has never been Christian. It is not Christian. It will never be Christian. It is papal mystery Babylon religion, as I show in this uh, CD that's available that I mentioned. So Romanism is not Christian. Only true Bible-believing people who hold the Bible as their final authority of faith and practice, like the old Lutheran Church that was so prevalent in Sweden, which gave the Swedish people victory uh, during the Thirty Years' War led by the great Gustavus Adolphus. Uh, that kind of Bible-based Christianity that Gustavus, uh, Gustavus adhered to was what made a nation great. So we, can, we must always distinguish between pagan Romanism and Bible-based true uh, primitive first century and Reformation Christianity. Mm. You know, one other thing that comes up, uh, you know, as a consequence to this, the reason why I wanted to address the background potentially of this is that this has uh, uh, progressed and continued up into to our time, so to speak. We have, of course, something called the the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, and there's many authors that have written about the, the connections between the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the Nazis, and, and even progressing up from that up to Al-Qaeda. Have you looked into these connections as well, Eric? Sure. Um, to, to first talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, you must talk about the Masonic Grand Orient Lodge of Cairo and Istanbul. Those two lodges in the Near East are the most powerful Muslim lodges. Out of the Grand Lodge in Cairo comes the mother Muslim Brotherhood. And the black pope, the Jesuit general who controls the white pope, Pope Benedict XVI, is the black pope through his army of Jesuits that controls all Freemasonry, be it Scottish Rite in the West or Grand Orient in the East, and therefore he controls all the leaders out of Grand Orient Freemasonry, which include the Islamic leaders. For example, Saddam Hussein was one. Another one was King Hussein of Jordan. Another one was Ataturk of Turkey. Another one is Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. All these Muslim leaders are high-level Grand Orient Freemasons, and thus they are controlled by the Vatican. 
So the Masonic connection to the Muslim Brotherhood can never be overlooked. Oh. Second of all, we, we know that after World War II, that many of your top Nazis were, were brought out of Europe by means of the Jesuits uh, using their Vatican rat lines, also called the Odessa. And uh, many of these top Nazis went into the Near East. They went into Egypt. Uh, Gurley Wanger, who was one of the heads of the Einstein groupies in uh, the East, he went into Cairo. And then you have a couple who went into Damascus. Uh, but you have these high Nazi SS officers that have gone down into these Muslim nations and aided and abetted and have been helpful in establishing the Muslim Brotherhood. We have the PLO. The PLO is led by Yasser Arafat. His uncle was Haji Min al Husseini. He was a Freemasonic a hoodlum, a Muslim, who was made the um, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem by Herbert Samuel. And Herbert Samuel was a Masonic Jew in England, in Britain, and because Britain had command of that land, breaking up the Ottoman Empire after World War I, they set up all their puppets in the new countries that they created. And one of their puppets for the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was Haji Min al Husseini. He was a Freemason. So the Jesuits in control of Britain and America for the entire duration of the 20th century set up all these Muslim leaders who were high-level Freemasons secretly subordinate to the Pope. Now, Eric, explain to us again and clarify for us the connection there between Freemasonry and the Vatican, because again, on the surface, a lot of people looking at this, they recognize the, the most of the Freemasonic brands, it's, it's more... Uh, clinging to a Protestant faction than a, to a Catholic one, but but explain that for us and what is the connection there? Okay, the remember that the Vatican always has an outward policy, but it is false, and then it has a secret policy, and that is the true policy. So the open policy of the papacy has, for the last two hundred years at least, been anti-Masonic that no Roman Catholic, at least till John Paul II made it okay for Roman Catholics to join the Lodge, but that no no Roman Catholic could join the Masonic Lodge or else he would be excommunicated. Yeah, yeah. That was, are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the open policy, or was the open policy of the Vatican till John Paul II. The real policy is that the Jesuits wrote the first, first, first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in 1754 in the College of Clermont in France, Paris, France. I have that documented from a Masonic source, and it's in my book. So the Jesuits, in creating Scottish Rite, the first 25 degrees, they then created the eight rites after that with Frederick the Great, when Frederick the Great, who was the head Freemason on the continent, protected the Jesuit order when Pope Clement suppressed the Jesuits with a papal bull in 1773, abolishing and extinguishing the Society of Jesus forever. And so it was Frederick II, or the Great, of Prussia, and it was Catherine II, the Great, of Russia, who were these two monarchs protecting the Jesuits during their 41-year suppression from 1773 to 1814. And during this time, the Jesuits were the masters of high-level Freemasonry, and they used their, their Grand Orient Masonic Lodge, in particular on the continent, to foment and ignite the French Revolution. Right. And in and igniting the French Revolution with Robespierre, who was Jesuit trained, the Jesuits then eliminated thousands of their enemies, including many Dominican priests. And then they um, they uh, brought Napoleon Bonaparte to power from Corsica. Yeah. And the Jesuits had been suppressed by the Pope. They had been expelled from South America. So some 2,000 Jesuits had been sent back from South America, from, the, from Paraguay and the, and, the, and the holdings of Portugal and Spain, because the Portuguese and the Spanish monarchs suppressed them out of their countries and out of all their holdings. So some 2,000 Jesuits were sent back to, to, uh, to Rome, and they then populated the island of Corsica, off the coast of France. Well, it's no, it's no coincidence that Napoleon would arise from Corsica. So Napoleon was the great avenger for the Jesuit order in punishing the Roman Catholic 
Catholic monarchs of Europe for suppressing the Jesuits, for punishing the Pope, for imprisoning Pius VII for five years until he would agree to restore the Jesuit order in 1814. And they also used Napoleon for the destruction of many Protestants in Germany to destroy the Protestant Dutch Republic in 1806. The Jesuits accomplished many things with their great avenger, Napoleon Bonaparte, only to then ultimately betray him and poison him at St. Helena. <laughs> but the connection to Freemasonry is this, that Napoleon Bonaparte was a French Grand Orient Lodge Freemason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, his, and his advisor, the second consul on the consulate, was Abbey Sayas. And Abbey Sayas was a Jesuit. So all the, the entire war maneuvers of Napoleon Bonaparte were dictated by Abbey Sayas. Abbey Sayas was on the directory, and then he was the second consul on the consulate, the first consul being Napoleon. So this connection of masonry to the Jesuits is undeniable, and this is also a connection to the Pope's Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists running Israel today, that they too are totally controlled by the papacy, by the black pope, through his control of Freemasonry. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I'm thinking back of the, you know, the, the perfect kind of mix or blend, if you will, between uh, Catholicism and uh, Protestantism. Uh, I'm thinking of, for instance, the Anglican communion that they have in, in the UK. I mean, some of the first United Grand Lodges uh, were actually, uh, you know, if you will, uh, formed at, actually, at the at, at the churchyard of of St Paul's Cathedral, and this was during the time that you know, and and this continues to this day, of course, uh, the British Church or the, the Church of England is is what is known as the Anglican Communion. Well, what's your take on that, and is that a merge between the two? Yes, the Jesuits have used Freemasonry to bring back all the Protestant sects. They've done it with the Presbyterians, with the Orange Lodge in Scotland. They've done it with the Dutch Reform, with lodges in Holland. They've done it uh, in England with their Grandmother Lodge in London there. And uh, you see Masonic power all throughout the old city of London. And just as an aside, we cannot forget that the Jesuits have controlled England since no later than King George III, that's 1760 that all the foreign policy of the English government has been pro-Rome, pro-Papacy, anti-White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, anti-true British Protestant people since no later than 1760. The United States has been controlled by the Papacy since no later than 1860, with the beginning, ultimate beginning of the war between the states in 1861. So all the domestic policy and all the foreign policy of the United States, which I call in my book, the Holy Roman 14th Amendment corporate fascist socialist communist American Empire hmm. created in 1868 on July 28th with the declaring of the constant, uh, declaring of the 14th Amendment to have been passed. With the creation of this empire, the American Empire has been nothing but the hammer of the Pope to subdue all nations to the temporal power of the Pope with a series of other purposes. So the way that the papacy has brought this is about is by using their high Freemasons to run America and their high Freemasons to run England to ultimately bring all sects back to the papacy. What about this uh, you know, expansion of the Anglo-American empire? A lot of other you know, authors are looking into this fact that uh, you know, with, with the wars, of course, we can, we can take the most recent Iraq and Afghani, uh, Afghani war that is going on right now. But this is uh, an attempt by the British and American Empire, if you will, to try to dominate and, and control the world. Is that just a front, you think? That's a front. It's the same kind of front that, was, that Hitler was accused of. That Hitler wants to conquer the world. He's going to come to America and conquer the world. That Hitler wants to have a thousand-year Reich. That's all a front. That's all a propaganda lie. That's the open but false policy of the Vatican. The true policy of Hitler was to purge as many Jews out of Europe as possible, was to be involved in the creation or the recreation of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, which we call Israel, and I defend the Jews' right to their land, of course, but I do not defend the government that runs that country. Uh, And also the purpose of Adolf Hitler was to kill as many heretic Orthodox people as possible. And on the, on the other hand, on the flip side, then, because the Jesuits were controlling Stalin and Hitler and FDR and Churchill all together, they were all working together, then after, towards the end of the war, the Jesuits were going to incite the Red Army to rape, pillage, and plunder the Protestant Prussian people, 
to the end that Berlin is destroyed, all the Protestant cities of Germany are destroyed, some 72 cities were bombed to smithereens, and so they were destroying the Lutheran Protestant Prussians and Germans in Germany, as well as destroying the, as many Jews out of Europe, as well as destroying Rotterdam, destroying as many Protestant cities as possible, the bombing of Hull and Coventry in England. Uh, so it was a tremendous pincer uh, movement on behalf of the Jesuits controlling both sides to the end now that Hitler never really wanted an empire. He hated the German people. He, he betrayed them many times. He ordered the bombing uh, of, uh, of Protestant cities by the Luftwaffe. He also ordered the German people to, to go down in the underground sewers to evade bombing, only to flood them and drown thousands of them. So Hitler was out to destroy the British people, or the German people, under the guise of creating an empire. Right. Well, the same thing's being done here. Under the guise of, of uh, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. Right. Under that, under that uh, lying propaganda, what is happening is this government in, the, in this empire is busy creating the world as the enemy for the American people, particularly the historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American peoples. And so that every nation in the world will be our enemy because of this foreign policy of Washington controlled by the Pope. And uh, at the same time, this is not a war of expansion, creating an empire. It's a war of annihilation. It's a war of annihilating the Shia Muslims. Because the Shia, in differing between the Sunnis, the leaders of the Shia, or the leader of the Shia, is considered to be infallible. He's considered to be divine. Unlike the Sunni leader, he is considered a mere temporal lord. So there can be no man on the face of the earth that is considered infallible or divine except the Pope. Therefore, we have to destroy the peoples that would seek to make this man or follow this man as though he is divine. Um, you know, you, I'm thinking about Skull and Bones, uh, George W., the boy Bush. Uh, if, if he and, and, of course, his administration, there's a lot of people behind that guy and so forth. We know that. But do you think that they are just uh, pawns in this game that are kind of willingly playing along? Or do they have full knowledge of that they're actually destroying the empire? Or do you think that they actually, you know, believe that they're helping to rebuild, you know, the, and and uh, and strengthen America? No, no, they have full knowledge they're destroying it. That's why they've shut down all of our oil wells. They've shut down Gull Island on the Aleutian chain in Alaska. It has more oil than all of Saudi Arabia. There's enough oil for 200 years. They've shut down Prudhoe Bay to us. When we, if we had Prudhoe Bay and uh, Gull Island, we would never need one drop of foreign oil ever again. They've deliberately shut it down. And the master of this topic is Lindsey Williams in his book, The Energy Non-Crisis. So they have deliberately made America, North America, dependent on foreign oil, specifically Middle Eastern oil, so that trillions of American dollars or Federal Reserve notes can be siphoned off over there for the benefit of the papacy because one of their goals is the rebuilding of Babylon. There you go. That is it, very interesting because, of, of course, you know, m many many people are looking at the Iraq war that that's all about oil, but what you're saying is that that, that also is another ruse. That's another front that people on the first level down into the conspiracy, so to speak, can get uh, trapped on, uh, in within, if you will. Is that right? That's right. This, this great conspiracy is not economic, it is not political. It is religious. Everything is religion because of the mystery Babylon religion that is essentially popery. And so everything they do is based on a mystery Babylon, pagan Roman Catholic uh, reason. And one of the things they want to do, as controlled by the Jesuits, because remember the black pope controls the papacy, is the rebuilding of the ancient city of Babylon. And the beginning of its building is Dubai. Really? So... That's correct. Dubai is the beginning of rebuilding of the ancient area called Babylon and the treasure city, the huge commercial treasure city of Babylon, according to Jeremiah 15, 51, Revelation 18, Isaiah 14. Babylon must be rebuilt because the ancient Babylon was never destroyed as the Bible says this has to be destroyed. The Bible says the city of Babylon has to be destroyed in one hour by fire. Well, ancient Babylon was never destroyed. So therefore, there must be a Babylon to be rebuilt in the future that will be destroyed this specific way. 
And so therefore, we are beginning to see the building of ancient Babylon. Uh, America is going to be in Iraq for many, many more decades. They're building the largest embassy in the world there, in the green zone. Mm -hmm. There's 14 American bases there. There is no intention of leaving for a long, long time, because it's a war of annihilation against the Shia Muslims, to the end that when this is finished, when this papal crusade is finished, then the Vatican will be able to begin to rebuild its commercial capital of the world, which will be situated on the Euphrates River, the ancient city of Babylon. And uh, you mentioned Dubai. That That's very interesting, I think, because a lot of uh, progress, so to speak, has been going on down there. And I mean, the, the, the city, some of the cities that they're building up are just, uh, you know, they're incredible, actually, <laughs> if you look at them. So I've seen some right. picture of it. It's, and inc it's incredible. It is. Absolutely. And, excuse me. Yeah, no, no, I just, I was also just going to say that they're building some of the, I don't know if you've seen these, they're, these are like uh, islands they're building uh, right right out in, in, in the ocean. These are uh, kind of miniatures of the world. This is like a, a mini uh, map, actually, of the world where we have uh, condos and things on there. It's like a city. Uh, and there's numerous things that they're doing. You know, they're bringing in uh, uh, kind of new new technology type uh, cities that are intelligently controlled. You have a like an RFID infrastructure throughout the entire city. You know, this is incredible. Uh, yeah, and this, uh, according to the Bible, Babylon, the city of Babylon, will be the commercial center for the coming Antichrist, for the coming beast, who I show in my book. Excuse me, is a coming pope, the final pope who will be killed. He will come back to life. He will destroy the Vatican with the ten military kings that he has in Europe. And then he will take, he'll not only go down to Jerusalem, to the third temple, and set his image there, which can talk and speak by the power of his false prophet, but he will also go to his tre treasure city of Babylon, and it is there that will be the universal commercial center where everyone will be commanded to take his name, his mark, or his number. And the, the control for all of this will be out of the ancient city of Babylon rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Interesting indeed. Uh, if we talk about the Iraq war and, and some of the things that have been uh, going on there, one of the things, of course, that is a huge scandal uh, a few, I guess, uh, almost a year ago now or even more, I, don't, I can't remember, uh, the Blackwater scandal, right? We have the, uh, I think it's the, now the former CEO, Joseph E. e. Schmitz, uh, who were, of course, uh, has connections to both Skull and Bones and, and Knights of Malta, as I understand it. Is that correct, Eric? I'm not sure about Skull and Bones. I, I don't know about that. I haven't seen that. But he is a Knight of Malta. His father was a Knight of Columbus. And so Joseph Schmitz, uh, who is on the board of Blackwater, uh, remember also that he resigned from the Pentagon as an inspector because he was told to invest, uh, investigate Blackwater. So rather than investigate Blackwater, he resigns and he goes to the board of Eric Prince. <laughs> right. Eric Prince was a Dutch Reformed. He converted to Roman Catholicism. And so Blackwater is nothing but a 21st century band of crusaders controlled by the Knights of Malta in this crusade against these... Uh, uh, infidel Muslims, quote unquote, justifying their mass murder. And that's what's going on in Iraq right now. It is a mass murder of men, women, and children who are Shiites, who the Pope has targeted as a threat to his temporal and spiritual power, unlike the Sunnis. In fact, the Sunnis are helping the American military and American government annihilate the Shia. Hmm. And yet, on the on the front, of course, uh, outwardly in the press, in the media, so forth, uh, Pope Ratzinger, as I call him, uh, is of course denouncing the Iraq War. Right? He's telling that all the things that are going on there is horrible. Yet he has these uh, underlings uh, from the Knights of Malta prominently involved in both the invasion and the conse consequent presence in Iraq. So that's uh, you that's know right. it's a double standard right there, correct? That, that's right. See, when you examine the facts, you see that the papacy is totally behind it. When you listen to its rhetoric, you know he's a liar, because the Pope is the biggest liar in the world. His lies kill millions of people. And so he is outwardly saying, this is not our war. But if it's not, if he doesn't want the war, all he would have to do is order his Cardinal Secretary of State to make one phone call to the papal nuncio in Washington, and that papal nuncio make one phone call to George Bush and tell him to end this war. And George Bush would set in motion the machinery to end this war whenever the Pope wants it ended. That's the kind of power the Pope has. 
Right, right. Furthermore, we know that 9-11 was, a, was an inside job. To, for anybody, any thinking individual to believe that 9-11 was not an inside job, he's not evaluating the facts. Right. And I would, I would strongly recommend for your listeners to review Loose Change number two. But there are many other good presentations on it. But inside job, the inside job of 9/11 involved the the uh, organized intelligence community of the United States. It all works together. If that's the case, the question is who was in charge of that organized intelligence community on 9/11? Yeah. And that and that answer is one man, George J. Tenet. Right. George J. Tenet, as you probably already know is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Yes. The Council on Foreign Relations is America's secret government based out of New York City, begun in 1921, and its overseer is the Archbishop of New York City, uh, today Edward Cardinal Egan. Hmm. Jo- uh, George A. Tennant is also a Knight of Malta. He was educated at the Jesuit School of Foreign Service, founded by Edmund Walsh. Edmund Walsh was the most powerful American Jesuit from 1922 to 1952. He controlled uh, Eisenhower. He controlled uh, FDR. He controlled uh, uh, Truman through the entire duration of the war. Edmund Walsh is the most powerful American Jesuit during this, what I call the Second Thirty Years' War from 1914 to 1945. Mm. So, And he's also a Knight of Malta. So here we have George J. Kennedy. He's a Knight of Malta. He is tutored by the School of Foreign Service, started by Edmund Walsh. He is a member of the CFR. He's, be, he's beloved of the new president of Georgetown University in uh, Washington. That new president is not a Jesuit. He is a Knight of Malta, John de Goya, and he's also a CFR member. So when you add it all together, it was Archbishop Egan of New York City who ordered 9-11. It was carried out by... DCI, Director of Central Intelligence, George J. Tennant, who was also a national security uh, advisor. And then to cover his tracks and make him not the center point of any attention, he resigns from the CIA. Mm. So that's how they cover their tracks in this. So this is a papal crusade started by the Knights of Malta, carried out by the Knights of Malta, and when the Vatican makes John McCain president of this country, his campaign manager at this time is another Knight of Malta. So uh, they, they, are, they are fully intending to continue this crusade, and they're uh, going to do a few more things in this country that are going to be uh, to justify the continuation of it. And, and uh, so what you're saying is that this was used, 9-11 then, this was used as a catalyst to enter into the Middle East again and start up another uh, holy crusade, right? That's right. This is just as much of a crusade as the nine crusades during the Dark Ages. And the, the, this crusade is, uh, of course, oil is involved as the cover and making money for Halliburton and, uh, and uh, other major corporations controlled by the Knights of Malta because they're not only going to kill off this Shia population, they're going to make billions of dollars for themselves and also pave the way for the rebuilding of Babylon. But the other thing is they're going to secure... Israel, which they call the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Now, as I cover on my CD, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem began in 1099 and it ended in 1291. Mm. And the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem was intended by the Pope to be his place of universal worship, but in the providence of God, the Pope really never got power over that kingdom. Mm. So um, uh, what happened was with the end of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem in 1291... Um, in 1291, the, uh, the, then the Vatican uh, uh, wanted to have uh, another crusade or so, but they always wanted to take it back, but they never could. So therefore, during World War I, the Jesuits used the British Empire, the Protestant British Empire, to then destroy the Ottoman Empire, which was aided and abetted by the Ottoman Sultan, Hamid, I believe, the fifth. And they took Jerusalem from the Muslims, and that was the beginning of being able to rebuild the temple there in the Temple Mount, and that was the beginning of reestablishing the Pope's Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. So this crusade will kill off many millions of Muslim enemies 
to the maintaining of the nation of Israel so that the Pope can build Solomon's Temple there in the Temple Mount, as we know that in 1993, the Pope's Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists deeded the Mount, that holy site, to the Vatican in September. And in December, the Vatican formally recognized the nation of Israel. Right. So that's the purpose for this crusade, I totally can believe. And the other thing is they're going to bring in tons and tons of gold out of the central banks that they've hoarded away from the people, and they're going to make this third temple an unbelievable eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> right, for that right. to happen, for that to happen, there can be no bombers. There can be no Palestinian bombers to upset the building of this. So all of those people have to be removed. Hmm. And this is going to be, of course, done or, or veiled in this disguise that now we have attained world peace, finally. The earth is safe, right? And now a new era begins of a thousand year of peace for mankind. That's what I kind of see on the horizon. What about you? That's right. That's, that's their propaganda. Right, that's right. right. Hmm. And, of course, we can discuss the uh, some of the aftermath here again of 9-11 and discuss some of the things that happened in the, in the U.S., of course. Uh, we can talk about the... Uh, chief architect of the USA uh, Patriot Act, Viet D. Dinh. Tell us about him, Eric. Well, Viet Dinh is a Vietnamese Roman Catholic, and he comes from a noble family in Vietnam, as did uh, President Diem during the Vietnam War. He is also a professor, or an adjunct professor, I believe, at Georgetown University, and he was also a deputy director, a deputy director of the uh, Justice Department, Assi- uh, Assistant Attorney General, that's what he was, Assistant Attorney General. And so this guy at Georgetown University <laughs> writes the Patriot Act of somewhat 200 pages that's immediately in place, ready to be introduced right after 9-11. Right. And, and not one American congressman read it. <laughs> not one. So they passed this thing under the guise of keeping America safe, blah, blah, blah. And now what we have is the real beginnings of the overthrow of our Fourth Amendment right, our Fifth Amendment right, uh, the implementation of fascism, because the Jesuits have sought to bring a fascist military dictator to power here in America since no later than the 1930s uh, with the quest of uh, John J. Raskob and other Knights of Malta to overthrow, quote-unquote, FDR and to to uh, implement this dictatorship under a dictatorship. Let, let's talk a little bit about Georgetown University. For people that, that might not know, uh, this comes up, you know, again and again in, in your in your work. Definitely in Vatican Assassins, we see people that, that attend this university and go there and teach there and so forth. Um, does this, if one goes, if someone goes to Georgetown University or teaches there, does that automatically mean that that person, you know, is is uh, is a Jesuit or endorse that particular theology slash philosophy, or even is of Catholic stock? Um, generally, not necessarily. The most of the people that go there think they're just getting a good education, which is true. But those on the faculty, they know the power of the Jesuit order. And they, if they have watched what's going on, know the direction of things. And they also know that the president, Supreme Court justices, powerful senators and congressmen, all meet at Georgetown University on a regular basis to discuss foreign policy, domestic policy, and so on. So, so it doesn't take... A, a real bright individual to see if they're a professor that Georgetown University is the capital of the United States. Hmm. It's only some four miles away from uh, you know the Capitol Hill. Yeah. yeah. So the so the Jesuits control all foreign and all domestic policy from the West Wing of the White House, added by the Roosevelt conspirators, and. Um, and then uh, that that foreign policy is dictated by the Jesuits from Georgetown as fine-tuned by their think tank called the Council on Foreign Relations. That's mm. how the American government runs. Right, right. And, you know, I think we, we need to begin to round things up here for this segment. I want to I wanna again ask you to uh, give out your website uh, address so people know how they can get a copy of your book, either in e-book form or the, the hardback, I guess. And also tell us again about that PowerPoint CD that you have for, available for people. Yes. 
Okay, to get the CD, the, the book CD, the ebook, it's uh, 40 Federal Reserve notes plus shipping. And uh, that's 1,836 pages that you can view on a computer. Or you can get the book. We printed 100 of them. We have about 40 of them sold, so we have about 60 more to go. Depending on how it sells, will depend on whether or not I print any more of them. And uh, you can get the book for 325 Federal Reserve notes plus shipping. And uh, then you can also get the PowerPoint CD. Now, for your listeners in Sweden, I think the book's a waste of money. Because all you got to do is get the CD. And then you can take the CD to your own printer in Sweden and have them print it out. And you would pay less for them to print out the book uh, than you would have to pay for buying the book and shipping it to Sweden. Hmm. So I would recommend get the CD for only 40 bucks then print it out in book form, then you have the book, and then you get the PowerPoint CD for 20 bucks, and then that brings you uh, up to snuff as far as Romanism being mystery Babylon religion, Romanism is control of Islam, uh, the Inquisition, the starting of the Jesuits, the Jesuits controlling Bohemian Grove, um, all the way to this present crusade, the purposes for Islam, the Jesuits' intent for the destruction of the Orthodox people like Serbia, um, all of that's tied into this extensive CD. It will take you two and a half hours to view it. But with that, in conjunction with the book CD or the ebook, you will have the whole package, a wonderful workbook, so to say, that you can then build on your knowledge as you discover new facts. So it keeps the, the reader up to snuff. And then I have my newsletter that you can get for 40, uh, 40 Federal Reserve notes a year, which is every other month, bi-monthly. And then I'll have pictures and new articles and feature certain men of power and politics that are controlled by the Jesuits so we can understand uh, what, where they are going and what they desire to do. The website again is vaticanassassins.org. Do check it out. Uh, we're going to take a short break here and then continue talking more in our member section about Knights of Malta, uh, the EU, and people behind the EU. We're going to talk about the circle and uh, much, much more.